Well, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Erica Anderson and I am a member of Waterline Church. I've gone here for about three years and I'm talking today with Darren Watts. Darren, thanks Hi. for coming on. Hi everybody. Hi Erica. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, Darren and I were just talking about how we were excited to see each other because it's been a yeah. long time. It's been yeah. a long few months since <laughs> COVID began, but yeah. We're actually not here to talk about that today, believe it or not. Um, but before we jump into what we are going to talk talk about, Darren, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are, um, how long you've gone to Waterline, and just help us get to know you a bit? Sure. Uh, well, I've been going to Waterline since uh, 2018. It was in January 2018 I first started going. Uh, I am a member of, you know, help out with the setup team, the turnout crew, and I help with the production team, and I do Facebook uh, hosting when we go online. So I do all of that, and... Um, You're a twin? <laughs> you don't want to say that? <laughs> I am. <laughs> I think that's interesting information. Yes, I am a twin. I am actually the youngest of uh, two, so I have an older sister, and then it's my... Uh, twin brother and then it's me uh, we're literally one minute apart uh, so it's not I guess we always tease mom and say oh it's just double the pay so. oh yeah I'm sure <laughs> many a twin mom has yeah. heard that oh, a lot of them have I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> well thanks for that introduction um okay so today we're talking about a hard subject um you know, m most recently we've seen um, some of the things that have been happening in our country surrounding racial justice. And um, as everyone probably knows, a couple of weeks ago, uh, George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. And uh, prior to that, a few weeks prior to that, we had Ahmaud Arbery killed while he was running. Um, there's been the story of Breonna Taylor. Those are just three of many, um, black people that have been killed um recently and has this whole um this has started a huge conversation in our country in a way that we haven't seen before it is not nothing new um but it is something that something's different about the way that america seems to be responding right now and so we wanted to talk to a few um, african-american members of our congregation and just get their take on what's been happening and how they feel about it. And, um, and so Darren, we're, I have a few questions for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so as a Christian who is a person of color, what's your assessment of the way you've seen fellow Christians and the church address modern day issues of racism? Um, it, because it seems like maybe it hasn't been enough in some ways. I will say it feels like a one and done deal. You know, it's, I don't know if, it, let me elaborate on one and done deal, meaning that there may be a teaching here and then that's it until the next one happened. And then there's a, another teaching when something else happens related to it. It's just more about the one and done deal. You do the teachings and then that's it. Uh, and mainly in that context of teaching is really about loving others but there's just not enough questions of people willing to be uncomfortable talking about racism uh, just like any other uh topic of women's rights equal pay and things like that nobody wants to be uncomfortable most people just wants to be comfortable as it may not pertain to them right and when you see these things happen when you see um somebody that looks like you either killed at the hands of police or killed at the hands of the two guys in the case of Ahmaud Arbery, they were not police. But how does that make you feel when you see that news story happen? Angry, frustrated, and judged, mainly. Um, <clears throat> you know, if I'm intimidating to police or somebody else because of the color of my skin, to me personally, it's unacceptable judgment as a Black man living, you know, this life. Uh, it, that could have been me lynched on the ground like that uh and and that's that's a reflection that i can see every time i watch that video so i should not have to really accept the fact that i am a target just because of my skin color uh because i always ask the question and i think it's a hashtag that go that's going around hashtag am i next that's mm. what i always think about am i next so it's it's hard to look at uh the George Floyd video is hard to 
look at the Ahmed, Ahmed Arbery video. I, between both of them, I cannot tell you which one is harder because I'm a guy that like to go out and do some jogging around the neighborhood. And I'm also a guy that always go out to the grocery store to, to get stuff. I don't know what my next encounter with the police would be like. So I always have to be very careful and always looking behind my back. Uh, so, so I, that was my next question was just like, what are some of the things that maybe you're thinking about on a daily basis or you're doing just as, just as an extra precautionary measure, just knowing that you may be profiled? Well, there has already been a couple instances where, I, well, only one incident I can think of that I was, you know, uh, racially profiled, but more of situations where I've been, um, been throwing racial slurs at. Mm. Uh, I'm at work at an instance. This was when I was 18 years old. Uh, just started this job. A white man that comes to my door because I'm guarding it because uh, at the convention center where I was working at the time uh, was being turned into exhibits. So where the doors I was at, I had to guard them and tell people not to come through because they're setting up exhibits there. You know, that's not a good thing. But I was telling him to go to the next uh, set of doors so he can go in and do what he needs to do. He didn't like that. He didn't like that 18 year old African American man was telling him to go to uh, the next set of doors. So he mouthed off, went around the corner, did what he did inside, come back out. And this is what he responds to me. Uh, he says that I have a lot of in common with brown sugar because I'm sweet and brown. Now, when he said that to me, I didn't know how to take that. So I asked for an opinion on what they thought about it. They said it's racial slur, you should report it. Fine. I go and report it. Manager on duty. He comes back to me later after I reported it and says that they will not go forth with it because they do not want to face off with their union. So not only did I get publicly humiliated by that, I was already angry enough and still had to maintain professionalism throughout the rest of the work day. That's hard to deal with. And a lot of people may not understand that uh, that racial slur in those words do hurt and it does bring an effect on you and he never apologized for it either so it's like he gets to do what he wants and not get in trouble for it and not be held accountable for it uh that's something i think about a lot and then with uh racial profiling in speedway indiana where i was living at the time this wasn't a few years because it's been maybe about 10 or so years ago uh, when i was living there the first time um, I was driving home from cleaning my church because I was cleaning the church as a, you know, part of like a, a side gig to bring in extra income. Uh, just as I'm getting close to home, I'm turning on the side street. Here comes a cop from behind me, the speedway cop I pulls me over. Now, the reason he pulled me over was legal. I had a, a tail light out. Fine. I'm expecting a ticket and go about my way. He comes back to the car. Me and my brother's in the car. He comes back to the car and says, uh, I smell marijuana. Do you have any narcotics on you? No, I do not have anything on me like that. I don't do drugs. So that's the automatic first assumption because of my skin color. So he looks around the car and says, step out of the car, both of you. Uh, we're placing you under arrest pending investigation. Pending investigation? Of what? Narcotics in your car. We smell it and we're going to find it. <sighs> okay. I did not want to, you know, the one thing that we're always taught is to comply with the police and do not make things any more difficult than what it already is. So I get out of the car, they place me and my brother in handcuffs, they call in more cops. They called in at least three or more Speedway police officers. They are in my car, tearing it up, looking for narcotics or drugs or anything that could land us in jail for the night. And I'm just sitting there just like, oh, for heaven's sake, why am I going through this right now? Why do you just automatically assume that I'm this guy with, you know, with, with drugs. This is the injustice that we face as African Americans every single day. The, he did not, he illegally searched the car because knowing that he did not smell it, he just wanted probable cause. Like I said, I was just expecting a ticket and move on, but no. Getting pulled over for a taillight, one thing, but then that led into another thing to say, yeah, let's just search the car for narcotics. I'm like, okay. Did you find anything? Like, no, we did not, so you're free to go. That's it. You wasted 10 minutes of my time for this. I got in the car, went home. Humiliated was an understatement. Mm. 
Amelia is an outstanding. Now you mentioned, um, you know, you said we're taught to respect bullies, do what they say. Right. Now we, I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, black parents give their kids the talk about the police. Can you, what, what's the talk? Can you tell us about that? The talk is mainly just this. If you get pulled over by the police, one of the main things you want to do is make sure you have your hands on the hand wheel at all times to make sure that your hands are visible so they won't think you have any guns. Uh, comply with them regardless to what they what they try to do to you. Just comply, don't give lip, because that's the one of the things they're gonna to try to use as an excuse on you when you are being pulled over. They're gonna say you was bad talking them, you was uh, using language you shouldn't have used. Uh, so it's, it's conversations like this that uh, I will eventually, that I always have with my own mother, even uh, with my stepfather and just a whole lot of people. You have to have those conversations to say you just need to comply with the officers, even though that they're, not within their rights. These are just, this is just also an injustice for us because we can't really just say, you know, no, you don't have a right to do this or anything like that. Because if we do, then that gives them more power to do whatever they want. And that's part of the injustice that we have to talk about every single day. Yeah, uh, that, that just makes me think of something, you know, as a, as a mom, I'm trying to think about how am I gonna raise my kids to be good citizens and good people. And one of the things I learned somewhat recently is that, you know, white kids grow up not ever really talking about race for the right. most part, at least in the Midwest where I grew up. Right. Uh, and I've, I've heard recently and I read in a book and I've been seeing it on social media um, that we, that's actually the wrong way to go about it, go about it because we need to be talking about race and differences. But the most striking thing is just that a black child would never grow up not talking about race. That's something that you are talking about noticing from the time you were born probably because um, you're always, you're not usually in the majority, especially in a place like Indiana. Right. So you're having to think about those things. You're having to think about how you look different. And so right. can you talk to me about growing up um, as a kid and, and how that played into conversations? There were several instances where my mother would uh, get pulled over. And the first thing that automatically triggered in her was nervousness, scared, because she didn't know what the police was going to do. When you're, <clears throat> and I hate to say this, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to respectfully say this, but when you're in a place like, or in a city like uh, Whitestown or Fishers or Carmel or Noblesville, which we was actually in, we was in Noblesville because she did bank runs during that time. When you get pulled over by the police, you never know what to expect. So us growing up, my mother, like, like I said, she will always just tell us, comply with officers. And as a kid experiencing that, when we first got pulled over with her in the car, it was just like, what are you so scared for? We didn't understand that. Not at that time, because it was the first time that it happened. What are you afraid of? It's like, that's another conversation, but right now, comply with everything. Don't even move. Don't move a muscle in your body. Don't do nothing. Is it really this serious? Yes, just do it. You don't have an option in this. Just do it. So, okay. We have to sit there, don't move, and, you know, the officer is, you know, in the car looking around. That makes you nervous. That makes you nervous, 100% nervous just to, think that he can easily find something to nitpick about, especially if you don't know how his day is going. It's one of the bigger things. <clears throat> so after all of that happened, thank God we didn't have, you know, any big major issues. But after that happened, she had to explain to us what racism is. She had to explain to us that uh, this is a thing of, uh, of white privilege that most police officers would, would do. They would do anything that they can to undermine us Black people in, in power. So if we're trying to, you know, live a decent life, but we get discriminated on, we have to fight our battles to be able to try to say, hey, we live here too. We have the same equal amount of rights when in fact we don't. Because the way that the world, <clears throat> excuse me, the way the world is trained now, we have to literally go without a lot. We have to do more. We have to work more. These are things that is not talked about. And even when I talked about it with my kids, not my kids, but my um, 
friends as kids, they never understood that. Mm -hmm. They never, ever, ever understood that. Uh, and I'm amazed that even kids today understand it far more than the kids of my generation because they just did not understand racism. They just like, it's no big deal. Cops are doing their jobs. Like, you just don't understand the significance behind that. You don't understand what a cop can do to black people and you just don't know it because we didn't have recordings back then. We didn't have camera phones to be able to record anything. So it's, it's just trying to <clears throat> teach us to survive. It's what mm -hmm. she was taught. We have to live to survive, not to, not to live to live life, but to survive. Because that's mm -hmm. what it was really about. Now, since that's what it was about. Since the past couple of weeks, um, have you seen <clears throat> like tone deaf responses from friends, maybe on social media? And what are some of the biggest disconnects that you see from maybe like white friends um, where they're not getting it? Okay, so there's three things. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's three things. One is literally, like I just mentioned, understanding racism. Now, just mm -hmm. because we're not being called the N-word or picking cotton doesn't mean that racism is a done deal. It exists because it's creatively being reformed in how it's, you know, still existing in today. So uh, what I mean by that, just in a real quick phrase, if you know, uh, if we're not picking cotton and the N-word is not being used on us, a lot of people just say, oh, it's a done deal. What are you worried about? No, there's more injustice behind that. There's more behind that, which brings me to the, the, to the second and the third point. Uh, just because Black people protest Black Lives Matter doesn't mean we are selfish. It, the purpose is to be heard on Black issues while living in America. Police brutality and racism is the two biggest things I can think of off the top of my head. All lives can't matter when there is injustice. And there's something that I read about the other day that kind of fascinated me about protesting in the flag, the Pledge of Allegiance, which was written by, uh, what's his name, Francis Bellamy in August of 1892. And this was how it was originally written back in 1892. I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And then in 1923, it was rewritten like this. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 1954, due to communist threats, President Eisenhower encouraged Congress to change that. So even though that Bellamy's daughter objected to that, this is how they end up changing it, and this is how it currently is right now. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, I say this because I want everybody to see what didn't change when it was reformed all three times. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It didn't change. Last I check on the Breonna Taylor case, nobody got charged. Nobody. Where's the injustice? Where's the justice in that? We see injustice on that. I'm at Auburn. It took 74 days for somebody to be arrested. And the only reason why those two fellows plus the third guy got arrested is because video service and it raged in protests like crazy. <clears throat> That's the only reason why they got charged. Yeah. So when you think about those injustices, it's where do we stand in the Pledge of Allegiance if we say that all lives matter with liberty and justice for all? But then you look at George Floyd with a knee on the back of his neck. Why? For a counterfeit $20 bill or a bounce check? Okay, that may be a crime, but that's not worth killing for. Is that what, is that what George Floyd's life worth is $20 for a bounce check? Where's, where's the justice? I mean, they get, they get fired and then they would have eventually moved on to another uh, police department. And they were out for, you know, maybe a day or two before one officer got arrested and then maybe a week or so later or something. I can't remember how many days it was after, but they all ended up getting arrested, all because of the protests, all because of the violence, all because of the riots. I don't condone those, but when, you, when you're not heard, you're going to make it a point to be heard. And then this one last misunderstanding needs to be mentioned. People are always trying to justify the killings. 
Have you realized that when they came out with the autopsy report for George Floyd, the first thing they said was underlining conditions that killed him? When somebody, when the coroner's office came out with that, it was like, why would you do that? Everybody's seen the video and that officer with his knee on, on the back of George Floyd's neck. You know that's automatic murder. That is automatic murder. No underlying conditions should not try to justify why the officer killed him. That is the privilege that they was trying to bring to the four officers in killing George Floyd. That's what we're talking about. These are the excuses that a lot of people would, would try to use. They say, he was high. He was lipping off. That don't mean that he deserves to be killed. And that's any Black person. That was the same thing with Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, any of them. You name them, there's a lot of them. It, so it's, it's sad to me because that, that goes along with racial uh, gaslighting. It goes with racial gaslighting because a lot of people tend to do that too. They tend to try to make it seem like that. Oh, the officers on duty have a you know right to protect and serve. Right. Absolutely, they do. But what they don't have the right to do is kill just because of our skin color. That's the thing that we're protesting. They're looking at us, they're intimidated, and then they want to try to justify the reason for why they try to kill us. So that's been one of my, one of my biggest pet peeves that I've seen on Facebook. That is the biggest thing that I've seen on Facebook. And it, and it hurts my heart because people are literally not trying to open their eyes and ears to the situation of why we're trying to protest. Well, let me ask you this. Is it ever hard for you when these situations arise to be a part of a church that's mostly white? Is it hard to feel supported when you don't feel like people truly understand how it feels? Honestly, yes, it does. Uh, based on what I read, again, based on what I read on Facebook, some just do not understand Black Lives Matter. Uh, people who are Black that genuinely do not understand the history of Black uh, history should not talk. That is what's helping the division. That is what's helping with racism. Uh, I have to second guess a lot of times if I ever want to go back to church again. It, 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 it's something that I didn't want to say, but it's something that I feel. It's something that... Uh, uh, I don't want to accept, but it's something that I have to, because when I read these Facebook posts, uh, they're doing exactly what, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reading. They're racial gaslighting. If I say, oh, black on black crime is really the biggest thing that y'all should be worried about. No, black on black crime is not the same thing as police brutality and uh, racism. The difference between those two and black on black crime is this. Black on black, black crime, when somebody commits a crime amongst black people, is meaning that they are not discriminating based on skin color. It's right. something personal that happened with them for the reason why that happened. Should have it happened? No, most likely not because of the way of the situation rolls out. It shouldn't resort to violence, but it does, just like with everything else. But black on black crime do not uh, discriminate because they're black. It's something that happened. Police brutality and racism, absolutely. You can look at news clippings that uh, that you can read gardening around black walking while black, running while black. Uh, what's the other one that I read? Um, sleeping. Sleeping, thank you, sleeping while black. Thank you for mentioning that, because that's true, I forgot. Sleeping while black is one of the biggest things. Breonna Taylor shot seven or eight times while she was sleeping, unarmed. And what's the, what's the common ground? All unarmed. Yeah. So when I, when I read those comments, I read that they say, yeah, you know, police brutality needs to be addressed, but at the same time, black on black crime needs to be addressed. But the one thing that they don't mention is racism needed to be addressed. Mm -hmm. How, how would you feel, or how would you like to see people being supportive of your fellow Christians in your church? Like what would be something that they can do to make you feel like, Hey, I'm with you. I'm standing with you on this. This is wrong. Well, there's a few questions that a lot of people can do to ask themselves while thinking about this. What can you do to support a person of color in your community? Uh, whether what are your local politicians' policy on in the police brutality? When you were taught, when were you taught about race and culture? Have you ever been taught about race and culture? If not, get into that because you may learn a lot. Uh, I always encourage people to go to the, the Underground Railroad uh, Museum, go to the African American Museum. Um, um, how do you help plan on helping to fight the end racial discrimination and systematic oppression? Because systematic 
uh, racism happens a lot also. Uh, how can you use anti-racial uh, knowledge to change and progress a conversation with friends, family, and colleagues and peers? Meaning if you're going to uh, be open to this, what are you willing to do to help uh, understand this issue and help uh, Black people be you know, equal with everybody else? Uh, how can you be actively anti-racist uh, instead of simply uh, just not racist? There's a big difference because a lot of people hide behind Facebook to do that. Uh, in my personal opinion. So they'll say that they're not racist, but they're high behind Facebook instead of opening up their ears and eyes. And last but not least, what can you do to learn more about racism? So mm -hmm. them are the questions I would say ask yourself when you're uh, wanting to have these uh, conversations or, you know, when to say, hey, I support you. Uh, what questions do I need to ask? What answers do I need? What can I do to help? That's well, that, you, you touched on what I was actually going to ask about, which which to me, it's it's not a I understand the concept, but I've heard a lot of it more recently. You can't just be not a racist. You need to be an anti-racist. And I think some people may not quite understand that. Could you explain more what that means? That means if you're going, if you, if you're anti-racist, that means you're really just supporting Black people. You're, you're not going on, like I, like I always say, you're not going on Facebook and trying to, you know, throw some racial gaslighting and saying, oh, uh, we y'all need to worry more about black on black crime. Or I'll read some comments that's just flat out just says, uh, all lives matter, who cares about the all black, li black lives matter movement? Who cares about that? That's racist. That to me is flat out just blankly uh, racist. Uh, I think about people with the Confederate flag. I think about, um, people that would literally disrespect and use racial slurs like with me somebody using the racial slur with me as uh racist anti-racist you're standing up for your black friends you're understanding uh black people's situation if you're not then okay i admit i am not understanding uh this and i am willing to open my mind about racism a lot of people that are anti-racist just flat out just close their minds to it and don't even care they just don't care. And that's what I've been reading a lot of. So a lot of people just don't care about, you know, trying to be uh, anti-racist and uh, racist. Well, it seems like the sort of overarching or one of the many overarching points that I've been seeing lately is just listen to black voices. And that's why we're talking with you. Um, but can you just talk about what is the importance of kind of just being quiet right now and listening to black people talk about how their lives have been affected? Uh, sure. Uh, again, the main thing, listening, uh, wanting to listen and learn. Uh, for me, that shows that you are willing to be uncomfortable to understand uh, the needs of Black people, not wants, but needs of Black people. Uh, any Black person can sit down and educate and talk and have friendly conversations and not, you know, intimidating ones. That's not what the, this would be about with anybody. You know, we're always willing to sit down and have these conversations with people, and I'm definitely one of those people. Uh, however, uh, again, I emphasize it. Um, one of the most things that people do that drives me insane is that they go and hide behind Facebook, social media, or they'll just not say anything at all. The one thing that I've learned is your comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing never grows there. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to continue to go behind social media and not say nothing you're willing to be comfortable about this situation instead of being open to it which it never will grow so if you stay in your comfort zone you're not wanting to grow you're not willing to talk about it but if you're willing to be uncomfortable about it you're willing to open up you're willing to say hey you know what let me listen to him let me listen to some of these protests let me see what i can do to help you're eager to learn and that shows that you're careful and empathetic. How do you think our faith calls us to speak out on issues of justice? Well, that our faith teaches us to love one another regardless of our uh, color of our skin, regardless of the uh, culture that we're living in. Uh, that's what our faith teaches us. So if we use our faith to say, you know what, Jesus said that, you know, if there's a, if there's an issue that is causing conflict amongst people, we need to sit down and talk about this. 
this is what faith teaches us because faith without works is dead and you definitely have to put work in in order for you to uh, get to that point you can't get there without putting in some sort of work so having that faith to go out and be uncomfortable and say let's talk about this what can we do to do better is using our faith to say i am encouraged that we can be better than what we are uh the faith that we have can be um it can be where no matter what the situation is let's work through this we can't be discriminating towards other people regardless rather if it's black life movement no matter what any type of uh, issue within the church outside of the church it's just mainly important just being faithful and you know saying let's talk about this let's not be close-minded to this because we're going to be close-minded to this what's the point of even having faith that's just how i see it. that's just me personally well i think that's a wonderful point so thank you so much darren that's all the questions i have for you and i just want to thank you so much for being willing to take the time to answer the questions yeah, and you. speak to people uh about some things they really need to hear right now um i know that i'm so thankful that you're a part of our church and i'm looking forward to seeing you in person again. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely